Hi, I'm Dr. GVK Chetnya Rao, your sinus doctor. In the chronic sinusitis video series, we spoke about what is chronic sinusitis, where are the sinus located, and I also made a video on DNA, that is diagnostic nasal endoscopy, which is a common investigation done for patients having chronic sinusitis. Today, I'll be talking about CTPNS, the preferred investigation for diagnosing chronic sinusitis, which is nothing but the CT scan of the nose and sinus. I'll be discussing on the role of CTPNS in diagnosing and treating patients having chronic sinusitis, the common concerns patients have about undergoing CTPNS, how CT scan is superior to X-rays in diagnosing the chronic sinusitis. Uh, also, I'll be showing you a normal CT uh, scan of the nose and sinuses and I'll be comparing it with an abnormal CT scan in a patient having chronic sinusitis. At the end of the video, I'll be giving you a bonus tip which you can definitely use. So keep watching. Before I begin my video, I would like to thank Dr. Vikas Reddy, Consultant Radiologist at Lucid Diagnostics Hyderabad for helping me with some parts of this video. Let us begin. So what is the role of CTPNS in diagnosing and treating a patient having chronic sinusitis? The sinuses are air pockets present behind the skull. For example, the frontal sinuses are present behind the thick frontal bone which is present just above our eyebrows. The maxillary sinuses are present behind the cheekbone. The ethmoid sinuses and the sphenoid sinuses are large sinuses present in the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bone which are present very deeply in the skull. So how do you visualize what is happening within these sinuses? The only way is to use a CT scan. How the sinusitis appears in a patient having chronic sinusitis I'll show you later. CTPNS not only helps in diagnosing sinusitis but it helps your sinus surgeon plan his surgery. The CTPNS films are carried along with you to the operation theater. When the surgeon is operating on you and when he is doubtful about certain findings, he goes back to the CT scan. If you see, the eye and the brain are separated by very thin boundaries from the nose. So it is very important for the sinus surgeon to plan his surgery in advance using the CTPNS to complete the surgery without producing any complications. CTPNS forms the heart and the soul of the navigation sinus surgery. I'll make a separate video on what is navigation sinus surgery. In navigation sinus surgery, CTPNS is used simply like Google Maps to reach your sinus destinations while avoiding the tolls and the roadblocks. So how is CTPNS superior to X-ray PNS in diagnosing chronic sinusitis? See, I, num I get a number of patients who come from villages and interior towns carrying an X-ray film of the nose and sinuses with them. I advise the CT scan of the nose and sinuses again for these patients. Let me explain you why. The X-ray PNS and CT PNS are technologically more than five decades apart. The amount of information you get from a CT PNS is far more superior to what you get from an X-ray of the nose and sinuses. We cannot visualize the ethmoid sinuses and the sphenoid sinuses within the X-ray PNS because of the positioning of the patient during x-ray and also because of the technological limitations. We can visualize the maxillary sinuses and the frontal sinuses in an x-ray PNS, but the disease within the sinuses will come out only if it is very, very significant. And even if we confirm chronic sinusitis within these sinuses, we cannot understand what are the drainage pathways looking like by looking at an x-ray of the nose and sinus. So now let me address some common concerns patients express about CTPNS. Is getting CTPNS not a radiation risk? CTPNS is a very simple scan. On you undergoing CTPNS, you expose yourself to 0.5 MSV. Naturally in a year in India, you expose yourself to about 2 to 3 MSV. That is you are getting one-fifth to one-sixth the dose you get from natural radiation by undergoing CTPNS. To put it simply, you can undergo four to five CT scans safely in a year. Who should not undergo CTPNS? Pregnant women, especially in the first two trimesters, that is in the first six months of pregnancy, and children below 15 years of age, should ideally not undergo CT scan until and unless it is very much necessary. Is it painful? No, CT PNS is not painful at all. How long does it take? 
it takes approximately 15 to 30 seconds for the CT PNS to complete. The more the slices of the CT scan, the lesser the time taken to complete the CT scan. Is it safe for getting CT PNS for my child? Like I mentioned to you before, children below the age of 15 years should not undergo CT scan of the nose and sinuses until and unless it is very much necessary. I have undergone CT PNS last year. Why is my doctor asking me to go for a CT scan again? If you, if three months have passed since the last time you underwent an investigation, your doctor will definitely ask for the investigation again so that he can understand to what extent the disease has progressed. Radiation wise, like I told you, you can undergo four to five CT scans in a year. So that's not a problem. How to store the CT scan for future use? The CT scan film on exposure to sulfur in the air gets degraded. So you have to always keep the CT scan film covered. Also, don't fold the CT scan film as it will cause some kind of staining on the CT scan. The CT scan films are going to be outdated in the coming five years. The CT scan films will start to get printed on photo papers or will be transmitted digitally. So now let me show you how a normal CT PNS appears. And I'll also show an abnormal CT PNS in a patient having chronic sinusitis and we'll contrast them both. So now we'll discuss about the normal CT scan of the PNS. You have to understand that in your CT scan film, you will see cuts in three ways that is coronal, sagittal and axial. Explaining about them, I think will make it too detailed and may even confuse you. So I will just be showing the images of the coronal cuts. I think this is very straightforward to understand. So let us begin now. If you see, what we are able to see is the nose here. This is the right side of the nose and this is the left side of the nose. And the central gray area, what you are able to see is the septum. That is the central partition which divides the right from the left. And as we keep going back, now we are able to see the sinuses above the eyes that is behind the forehead. These are called the frontal sinuses. If you remember, I told you that the sinuses are nothing but air pockets. So air usually appears black on the scan. So this is a normal scan. So you don't get to see much of any disease. And as we keep going towards the back, you can see there's a slight bend in the central partition that is a septum. Mild bend is very commonly seen in many people, not a major concern. Now, as we keep going behind, we're able to see the eyes this is the right eye, this is the left eye and in between the eyes, this area, this sinuses are called the ethmoid sinuses as they are towards the front, they are called the anterior ethmoid sinuses. Now as we keep going a little behind, we are able to see the swellings which are projecting from the side walls. The bottom one is called the inferior turbinate and the top one is called the middle turbinate and this is present on both the right and the left side. Now here we are able to see the sinus behind the cheek, which is called the maxillary sinus. So we can see the upper teeth also over here. And as we keep going a little towards the back, we are able to see the sinuses in between the eyes towards the back region. These are called the posterior ethmoid sinuses. And as we keep going even more behind, we can see the last sinus very deeply present inside the nose. This is what is called the sphenoid sinus and the nose opens into a large cavity behind the nose. So if you see, this is what is called the nasopharynx where the, this is the area where the adenoids are situated. And here we are able to see the eustachian tubes. This is the left one and this is the right one. This is through which the nose ventilates the ears. So if you carefully notice, like I mentioned already, the sinuses especially the thmoids are very closely related to the eyes. They are just separated by very thin bony walls on either sides. And if you go a little behind and if you see just above these ethmoid sinuses, we can see the brain. And again, if you see there is very, very thin bony covering over these sinuses. So it is very important for the sinus surgeon to carefully evaluate the CT scan of the nose and sinuses to carefully complete the surgery without causing any complications. So now let us see the abnormal CT scans. So the image on the left is the 
image of the patient having a normal CT scan that is normal CTPNS. The image on the right is of a patient having sinusitis problem. I'll be showing two abnormal CTs at different ends of the spectrum, one with a chronic sinusitis and one of a patient having nasal polyposis. So if you see the image on the right here, as we keep going backwards, we are able to see the frontal sinuses and if you carefully see, you can see this grayish lining in the left frontal sinus. This grayish lining indicates that there is pus formation in this sinus. And as we keep going even more behind, you can see this grayish lining in both the frontal sinuses. In comparison, if you see a normal CT scan, there is it appears completely black. There is no collection of pus anywhere, so there is no grayishness. And as we keep going back in the abnormal CT scan, the patient having chronic sinusitis, you can see these are the sinuses between the eyes. These are called the anterior ethmoids. And again, if you see a normal CT scan, it should appear completely black. But for us, if you see, there is grayish collection of pus in both the sinuses. And these are the sinuses below the eyes, which are called the maxillary sinuses. And if you see, in our patient who has chronic sinusitis, you can notice that there is collection of pus in both his maxillary sinuses. We already spoke about the turbinates. This is the right inferior turbinate, middle turbinate, left inferior and middle turbinate. You can see the size difference between the right side inferior turbinate and the left side inferior turbinate. The left side inferior turbinate is definitely enlarged, increased in size. The middle turbinate is slightly enlarged when compared to the right one. And as we keep going even more behind, these are the post -rhythmoids. Again, the sinuses between the eyes. Again, you can see collection in both these sinuses. And if you start observing the central partition, that is a septum, is bending towards the right side in this patient. And if you carefully see now, the sinuses below the eyes, the maxillary sinuses, there is some kind of a polyp formation in the left side sinus. And also you can see small undulations. This is nothing but the swelling within the right maxillary sinus. And as we keep going even more behind, this is the sphenoid sinus of this patient. It looks clear. There is no grayishness anywhere. So there is no issue within that sinus. And as we keep going behind even more, so we are able to see the nasopharynx if you remember me telling you, this is the area where the adenoids are situated. So, if you see this area, normally it should appear like this. But for our patient, there is some kind of swelling in this area. So, there are slight adenoids for this patient. So, let us now discuss about the next case. So, this is the second case. Now, we are seeing a patient whom I recently operated on. She is a patient who is having severe nasal polyposis. I'll try to make a video separately on what is nasal polyposis and how do you treat it. But anyways, coming back to the scan. So this is the left frontal sinus. So these are the frontal sinuses of the patient of the normal patient. And if you see the patient having severe nasal polyposis, you can see both the sinuses are completely filled with pus and the polyps. There is no space for air at all. If you see this black column in a normal scan, this is through which we can breathe. For this patient, if you see, the polyps have completely occupied the nasal cavity. Only this black column is through which she can breathe. And as we keep going towards the back, these are the ethmoid sinuses, the anterior ethmoids to be precise, in the front part of the nose. And you can compare it with a normal scan. You can see the normal ethmoids appear completely black like this. But for this patient, it is completely filled with pus and polyps again on both the sides. When patients have such significant severe nasal polyposis, these patients cannot perceive smell. If you see, the upper part of the nose is where the olfactory nerve fibers are situated. That is the nerve fibers which sense the smell. So there is no air column 
like you see on the normal scan for the air to reach the top part of the nose where the sense of smell is perceived. So that is completely lost for this patient because it is completely blocked. Now as we keep going towards the back, these are the sinuses behind the cheeks, the maxillary sinuses. Again completely filled with pus and polyps and if you see uh, you can compare with the normal scan how it appears, it's completely black. And the same situation continues even towards the back in the posterior ethmoids you are also able to see it completely occupying the polyps completely occupying the back part of the nose in comparison you can see the normal posterior ethmoids here and as we keep going even towards the back we are entering now the area of the sphenoids so if you see normal sphenoids they should appear completely black like this again and this particular scan we are able to see the pus and polyps are completely obliterated the sphenoid sinus and usually by this time the, the turbinates what we have discussed previously become very small in size so the uh, space in the nose increases much more as we keep going towards the back which is not the case for this patient she has only so much space to breathe through so i hope you, I hope you have understood uh, the differences between the normal ct scan and the abnormal ct scan so now the bonus tip if you are undergoing a ct pns at the center you are undergoing, ask for a DICOM CD. If they are unable to give you a CD, at least record the data on a pen drive. This will help you keep it along with you for longer duration of time and also when you take the CD or the pen drive to your the ENT doctor, he will be able to see all the cuts of the CTPNS clearly. On a film, you only get one sixth of the data what they actually get when they're doing the CTPNS for you. So remember that and follow this very simple tip. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Let me know your suggestions and comments in the comment section below. Thank you so much and I'll see you soon in the next video.